How do you imagine the life of a noble aristocrat beauty of the 19th century? Endless balls, parties and a crowd of fans? But in the 19th century it was considered secular duties, a kind of service. Sometimes it was unpleasant and even dangerous for health. So, let's leave one day with the social light of the 19th century in the Russian Empire and find out what did social beauties check in the morning instead of social networks? Why did they drink vinegar and eat chalk? And why was pneumonia, which killed many aristocrats, called muslin disease? What other fashion trends were literally deadly? How many dresses did they have in their wardrobe? And how much did parents spend on a 17-year-old beauty? Why was one of the brightest socialites called a witch by Pushkin, but considered saint and called pious in Italy? How did her love affair with the emperor end? Why did the high society bring happiness to nobody in the end? And why did our heroine leave the society as a result? So, let us introduce our protagonist to you. Princess Zinaida Belosalska Belozerska, a translator, femme fatale, one of the most brilliant socialites of her time. Today, we would call her It Girl. The most famous poets and musicians were crazy about her, but her only passion was platonic. At the same time, it was believed that she brought misfortune to those who loved her. She was born in a very noble family, which was descended from Rurik. Her father, Prince Belosalski Belozersky, was also considered one of the most beautiful and erudite men of his time. He was even called Moscow Polo. She did hardly know her mother, who died during childbirth. Zinaida had spent her entire childhood in Europe, recently returned to Russia and became a lady-in-waiting to the Empress. The morning of our social beauty begins around 10 a.m. It is not too late, considering that she was dancing at the ball all night long. Today, the first thing to do in the morning is checking social networks, and in the 19th century, beauties were checking invitations in the morning. They were sent out 5-7 days before the event, and could only be refused in exceptional circumstances. And it was necessary to invite to parties, balls and receptions everyone with whom you are in friendly and social relations. It looks like it's time to relax and laugh around, but it's not. The morning was the time when the aristocrats were in public in numerous social events. Our young princess is preparing for a new day. Back in the 18th century, even an ordinary day, noble woman couldn't afford carelessness in clothing, flat shoes and the absence of such an intricate hairstyle that, according to contemporaries, made the ladies sleep sitting up until the day of the reception to not spoil the headdress. At the time when Zinaida lived at the beginning of the 19th century, naturalness and simplicity came into fashion. You'd think secular ladies got final luck, but they didn't. The fashion was interesting pallor of brunettes and peak cheeks of blonde ladies, and here the rules prescribed the poor girls to drink vinegar for paler and eat crushed chalk and the blondes had to eat rare steaks and even put them to their cheeks to make them pink. An important detail of the beauty's appearance was small, white and delicate hands, so women were even forced to sleep in gloves to achieve the desired result. Our Princess Zinaida's other's thought was a miracle of beauty. Her golden hair and the eyes as blue as the sea lawn sapphire impressed the poet Kozlov. This is how he remembered her before he went blind, but he continued to sing her all his life. 
she easily conquered the most unapproachable dandies of the empire. But it wasn't just about her appearance. Zinaida got an excellent education, she knew eight languages, was an outstanding singer and actress, wrote poetry, and was well versed in art. She remembered yesterday's imperial ball and realized that for the first time she had fallen in love herself with all the passion she was capable of, and her chosen one was the young and beautiful Emperor Alexander, a brilliant intellectual and womanizer. Except he's married and he already has a mistress. Our beauty is ready for the day, now she has to choose a dress. To comply with the secular dress code, a family needed a great fortune, because the wardrobe had to contain modern dresses, home dresses, dresses for visits, dresses for walks, evening dresses, for the theater or parties, and of course, ball gowns. To save the money, freshly sewn dress went down to the lawyer category, after the ball and so on. In 1804, the magazine for Cute calculated how much money parents spent on a 17-year-old beauty, starting with the cost of pins and ending with dresses, hairdresser services and a lorgnette. They needed more than 55,000, for a comparison a house rent was about 30,000. You could buy cheaper at the sales on the first week after Easter, but those who wanted more expensive things went to the English store on Nevsky Avenue, one of the most expensive in St. Petersburg, here bought the Emperor. No less chic was considered to go to the Lions store and buy a hat from Madame Louise on Nevsky, or order a bouquet in the Fleur Denise store. Well, if you think that for the sake of such a cheerful life you can tolerate vinegar, maid and even chalk, think again. Secular beauties usually didn't live very long. The biggest trouble of that time was dresses. The thinnest semi-transparent muslin which imitated ancient statues became deadly in the Russian climate. And considering that such dresses were also wetted with water even in winter, so that the fabric would stick to the body and emphasize the curves. Can you imagine how did the health of the beauty suffer? In the beginning of the 19th century, pneumonia was even called muslin disease. An epidemic of pneumonia raged in Paris in 1803. According to various sources, several tens of thousands of people fell ill there. The Parisian newspapers were full of modern chronicles. Madame de Nail died after the ball at the age of 19. Mademoiselle de Junior at 18. Mademoiselle Chaptal at 16. And this is in France, but imagine the Russian winter and beauties in wet dresses. During a few years of this extravagant fashion in Russia, more women died than in the previous 40 years. In the 20s, muslin went out of fashion, but a new trouble appeared. An hourglass figure with a wasp base came into fashion. Women began to pull themselves into corsets. It is known that in 1859, a 23-year-old fashionista with a perfect waist died after a ball, because three ribs squeezed by a corset pierced her liver. But this is not the end. When wide-brimmed hats came into fashion, the ladies had to walk almost by touch, because the brim completely blocked the view. And those skirts of the dresses! Poor society beauties lost themselves in their own dresses. Even Queen Victoria once sprained her ankle when she stepped on the bottom of her own dress. British scientists in the 1820s wrote in the Lancet magazine that women should blame their dresses, which weighed about 20 kg, for muscle weakness, diseases of the nervous system and other ailments. Shortly after the ball, the court began to talk about the young emperor, who paid too much attention to the young lady-in-waiting of the Dowager Empress, talked and danced with her at the Metropolitan Balls. Princess Belaselska Belazerska was happy, 
but the Empress affair with the lady-in-waiting put her reputation at risk. Even in their affair went no further than a simple courtship and exchange of pleasantries. Then the princess was hastily married to the unloved one, Prince Nikita Volkonsky. In foreign campaigns he had served to the emperor for his heroic exploits, he was awarded orders and a golden sword for bravery. But after the war, the major general of the retinue at the age of 39 fell in love with the 18-year-old queen of muses and beauty. At that time, marriage was not a direct consequence of love, rather the opposite. If you are lucky, then, after marriage, the couple could fall in love with each other. However, not many people were lucky. Our protagonist didn't love her husband. Well, in the evening to a ball, and what did the social lights of the 19th century do all day long? In fact, they had no time to do nothing. Life in the capital required compliance with a huge number of rules of etiquette, to which the daily routine was completely subordinated. It was a real hell for a sociopath. Firstly, between 12 and 2 o'clock in the afternoon, a breakfast party. There were served only six types of snacks, main course, then two snacks in between, and two stews. Then, according to social etiquette, there were visits that for 15-30 minutes, time to exchange social news. The visit was supposed to thank the hosts for a dinner party, a reception, or a ball. Moreover, it was necessary to respond to the visit with another visit within the next 3-5 days. Another social event was a promenade, a walk on Nevsk Avenue. About 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the ladies were flaunting with their outfits, communicating with one another and gossiping. And the more improbable and absurd the rumor was, the more it was believed, said contemporaries. Then followed a dinner party, which were given by every self-respecting family man from time to time. But what about the restaurants? Dining in restaurants in the 19th century was a risky business, and it was possible to suffer from stomach pain for several days after that. But dining in a restaurant was little indecent for a married man. That would mean the wife can properly take care of her husband. Well, a woman could appear in a restaurant at the resort only. To enter a restaurant alone meant for a noble woman to compromise herself instantly and irreparably. After dinner they went to the theater, in the evening to a ball or a routh. The ball was an awfully expensive pleasure for the host party. The guests started arriving after 6 or 9 in the evening, some were arriving by 10 or midnight, and the ball ended at 4 o'clock in the morning. By the way, balls were not always perceived as entertainment. It's nice to dance once every two weeks, but it's unbearable to dance so often. My health is suffering. This was written in a letter of a socialite of the 19th century. Their health really suffered. Colds, pneumonia, miscarriages, that was the price of endless balls that society beauties had to pay. You would say, just refuse and that's all. The truth is, it was impossible to refuse the ball without offending the influential hosts. And those who referred to the illness too often could be even banned from the society. Women who wanted to look like socialites and have titles, wealth, nobility. They followed the court, humiliating themselves just to achieve a condescending look of the powerful ones. The mothers of young girls understood the role that well-chosen lovers from among the aristocrats close to the court could play in the fate of their daughters. They never hesitated to enter the easy romances themselves and throw their daughters into the arms of those who were in favor.
In general, the high society didn't hide its unpleasant underside much. And here we meet our protagonist again. Her passionate romance with the Emperor reignited with a new force during the foreign campaign of the Russian army, 1813-1814. Their huge correspondence is stored in the United States in the library of Harvard University. After the end of the war, bulls and parrots began, and Zinaida Volkonska were shining next to the Emperor again, and new gossip spread throughout Europe. At the same time, their romance, judging by the letters, remained platonic. He wrote to her, Believe that I am yours for the rest of my life, both in heart and soul, and I will also say, shame on anyone who thinks ill of this. The emperor returned to Russia to his mistress and wife, and Zinaida loved him until his death. The clever, subtle, talented and educated princess couldn't stand the high society for a long time. She retired from the court and took up writing a scientific work on the history, ethnography and archaeology of Russia. The high society didn't accept this research. Then, Princess Volkonska went to Moscow, where she owned the most fashionable social salon, and was a real style icon. Today we would call her It Girl. The most outstanding artists, poets and musicians gathered here. Many of them lost their heads at first sight of Princess and hopelessly fell in love with her. If you think that it was so pleasant to be in the center of male attention in that gallant age, to be praised and worshipped as a muse, then you are very mistaken. The society was cruel, they sang you in the verses, and behind your back they told bad things. Russian poet Pushkin, who called our princess Volkonska the queen of muses and beauty in his verse, called her then a witch and wrote about her with obscene language. That's why that what happened next to our protagonist surprised all those who knew her. She left Russia for Italy, converted to Catholicism, took a vow of poverty and donated her entire fortune to charity. A friend who visited her in Rome shortly before her death wrote, the prelates and monks had completely bankrupted her. Her house, all her possessions, even the crib where her husband's body laid, everything had been sold for debt. She had always been a compassionate person, but at the end of her life, helping others became almost an obsession for her. There is a legend that one winter the princess saw a frozen beggar, took off her woolen cloak and covered a beggar. And at the same time, she caught a bad cold and died. It was said that crowds of ordinary people followed her coffin. In Rome, she was called a saint and gave one of the streets her name. Today, near her villa, people throw coins into the fountain, asking to return to the Eternal City. Do like and subscribe if you enjoyed this story. Oh, and click on the bell so you get notified when the new episode comes out.